shortly after the German Grand Prix, Rick Astley released his debut single, Never Gonna Give You Up, written and produced by the massively successful Stock, Aitken and Waterman partnership. It went on to top the charts in 25 countries with total worldwide sales well in excess of 6 million. Thanks, in no small part, to a certain internet meme, the YouTube video uploaded in 2009 has clocked nearly 1.3 billion views and 15 million likes. Not jealous at all. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II opened the Docklands Light Railway in London. The former port area of the City of London had become run down and abandoned following the move to container shipping in the 1960s and 70s and was now being redeveloped as an expensive offices and flats district, with many newspapers moving away from their traditional home on Fleet Street to the area. The Docklands Light Railway was the first automatic driverless railway in the UK, mainly on overhead viaducts. In the US, the Federal Communications Commission rescinded the Fairness Doctrine, which had previously required broadcast media to present alternative viewpoints on controversial issues, albeit not necessarily to give them equal airtime. While both main parties in the US had used the doctrine to harass channels sympathetic to the other, forcing them to constantly issue retractions and rebuttals, the main reason cited in its lifting was that of limiting government intervention in free speech. The lifting of the Fairness Doctrine is now considered a turning point in the political polarisation of US media. Not long afterwards, Rush Limbaugh gained national syndication for his particular brand of abrasive, controversial talk radio. There was big news in F1 too, because Ayrton Senna had announced that he would be exercising his option to leave Lotus after three years, and Peter Waugh immediately announced his replacement by Nelson Piquet, who had made no bones about why he was leaving Williams. I signed a contract with Frank to be a number one driver and uh, this contract was not uh, a respect the way uh, I want. I got a, a offer to, to be a number one driver on another team and I accept I want to race for more four or five years and uh, I don't want to get aggravation to lose a championship like I lost last year. And what of Senna? Uh, he was too canny an operator to hand in his notice without another contract in his pocket, but with whom? The smart money, said McLaren, rumours had been circulating since the end of last year that Ron Dennis wanted him but needed to wait another year for his contract to be up. But would Frank Williams come in with a better offer to make it a straight driver swap? If not, who would fill PK's seat for 1988? Bootson had been rumoured as a Williams target, but had just signed for another year at Benetton. Silly season had come early for sure, but there was a motor race to be getting on with too. The teams had unexpectedly enjoyed their trip behind the Iron Curtain last year, and in 1987 the Hungaro ring looked much better, having had another year to put all the finishing touches to the paddock, grow some grass on all the bare patches, and generally make it look its best. Unfortunately, the weather wasn't showing it to its best advantage, overcast and chilly, albeit mostly dry. The Ferrari contingent were being led by Harvey Postlethwaite, with his fellow Brit John Barnard sequestered at his studio near Guildford, working hard on next year's car, which will have a normally aspirated V12 engine. Lotus, meanwhile, had their promised new aerodynamics with a lower profile engine cover and side pods and a more heavily cutaway cockpit opening. Senna agreed that it was certainly an improvement, but felt the car still lacked mechanical grip. Mansell was quickest on Friday, but locked his brakes and spun on his best lap on Saturday, leaving Gerhard Berger to go fastest, despite a dicky tummy, though not quite enough to displace the Williams at the top overall. But it was the first front row start for a Ferrari since their last win, Germany 1985. A good omen for Maranello? Behind them were Piquet and Prost, then Alboreto in the second Ferrari, and Senna back in sixth after continually popping off his boost control valves prematurely. Bootsen and Johansson were on row four, with Warwick ninth, suffering a dose of conjunctivitis and a bout of flu just for good measure, and Patrese making up the top ten. As expected, the atmospheric cars were looking a lot more competitive here, with the Tyrrells and Alio up in the middle of the grid, ahead of Nakajima and the slower turbos. Zack Speed slid even further towards the back, and Pascal Fabre was bringing up the rear as usual, but within ten seconds of pole for a change. The Hungaro ring was packed once more on Sunday with some 200,000 spectators, and the owners of the Österreich ring probably hoping not too many of them were here instead of in Styria next week. And the weather was nice and hot, which should go some way to alleviating the lack of grip some drivers were complaining of from the new smooth track surface. Berger rolled a little just before the lights went green and lifted just as they did, so he was slow away, losing second to PK, while Alboreto also got a great start and managed to muscle his way past PK too. With few places to pass, that was how it remained at the end of lap one. Mansell led Berger, Alboreto, Piquet, Senna and Prost. 
The Ferraris looking livelier than they had in some time, while Nakajima headed to the pits on lap 1 with a drive shaft failure. The Ferraris stuck with Mansell for the first few laps with PK in tow, as the leading four drew out a gap from Senna, who seemed to be holding up Prost and the others. Bootsen took six from Prost on lap 3, followed shortly afterwards by Johansson. The tag engine in Prost's car was suffering another one of its intermittent misfires. Further back, in a neat little bit of driving, Alio spun into the gravel, knocked it into reverse, went all the way through and got going again. Less fortunate was Dana, whose engine blew on the same lap. Mansell and Berger began slowly drawing away from Alboreto, and the Austrian was harrying Mansell, looking to either pressurise him into an error or find a spot to nip through in the infield, as the Honda power allowed the Williams to outpace the Ferrari on the only straight. Behind these two, the order was reversed, with PK worrying at Alboreto's rear wing. By lap 13, it was still Mansell, Berger, Alboreto, PK, Senna, Bootsen, with Johansson and Prost in 7th and 8th. But not for long. Berger's differential went and the Austrian was out. Disappointment for Berger and sympathy from the fans at the track, but now it was on to Alboreto to take up the mantle. PK was still champing at the bit, trying to get past the number 27 Ferrari, with Mansell now beginning to disappear into the distance, and overtaking at the Hungaro ring remains a tall order, and Alboreto seemed to be able to do just enough to prevent Nelson going past. Johansson's gearbox broke just as he was going into a corner, pitching him into a spin and nearly taking out Prost, who had to take avoiding action, and Stefan was joined in retirement on the same lap by Teo Fabi with another gearbox problem, and Adrian Campos spinning his Minardi off. Behind the leaders, Bootsen was chasing Senna hard, but again finding no way past the Lotus, despite Senna's unhappiness with the general handling of the car. But for the moment, at about one-third distance, the race was looking pretty static as neither PK nor Bootsen could make any impression on the cars in front, and Mansell was easing away at the front as they made their way through traffic. With most teams having planned to go non-stop, there wasn't even the prospect of a tyre stop to shake things up. Finally, on lap 9, PK pounced on a mistake by Alboreto to take second, so now it was once more one Williams chasing another, with PK having just over half the race to make up a 13 second gap, eminently doable. But as had been painfully evident so far, in the immortal words of Murray Walker, catching was one thing and passing was quite another, especially between these two warring teammates. Not that Mansell was just going to circulate and let PK catch up, of course, and he responded, and the gap began to fluctuate as the two traded fastest laps as the race approached half distance. Nonetheless, the pace was slow enough overall that the leaders finished the half-distance lap after 65 minutes, suggesting the race might not even go its full distance but end after two hours. On lap 43, there was another collective groan from the crowd as Alboreto rolled to a halt with a dead engine, a promising weekend for Ferrari coming to naught once again. De Cesaris had retired on the same lap with the gearbox failure, and remarkably they had been the first retirements in nearly 30 laps. They were soon joined by Brundle, whose miserable weekend overall came to an end with yet another blown Zaxpeed engine. Arrows had a bit of a chaotic spell as Cheever pitted for tyres, but then had a slow stop and as he eventually got away, Warwick was just arriving for his. Fortunately, they managed to get Derek going again without too much fuss, only for him to get a flat right rear halfway round his outlap and have to come right back in again. The Senna boots and scrap with Prost fifth continued as Alio irrevocably bent his low law on the barriers and retired, and Bootsen started suffering boost problems and dropped back, losing fourth to Prost. But behind the Williamses, they were all walking wounded. Senna with handling difficulties, Prost with a misfire, and Bootsen with a lack of boost pressure. All of which must have heartened Ricardo Patrese, now running sixth, and hoping he might finally get some points on the board. As the final third of the race approached, PK seemed to turn up the wick a bit and close to within nine seconds of Mansell, but once again the Brit responded, pulling another second out once more. The duel on the timesheets had sped the race up, though, and it would now go the full 76 laps as Mansell approached Prost to lap him. Only, he never got the chance. With just six laps left, the lead Williams slowed dramatically and started weaving. Out of fuel, wondered some, which would be a massive miscalculation if so, but no, a wheel nut had come off, and the resulting wobble made the car completely undrivable. So, as Nigel wearily trudged back to the pits, Nelson Piquet took the lead and ran the last six laps to take his second successive win, having led less than 30 miles on the track across the last two races. Trailing in his wake came the walking wounded, with Senna taking second and Prost third, Bootsen holding on to fourth, Patrese fifth, and Derek Warwick plugging away to take sixth place, despite all of his own illnesses and misfortunes. Jonathan Palmer took seventh and the three and a half litre win, with Streff ninth and second, which pretty much wrapped up the Colin Chapman trophy for Tyrrell, barring some extremely unlikely mathematical events. 
Nanini put his and Minardi's first finish of the year on the board, and Fabra was once again last but still running. So Mansell dropped further behind the two Brazilians in the title race and was now equal on points with Prost, with PK extending his lead to seven points, and no doubt delighted to have put one over on Mansell once again. The teams packed up for the short drive to the Österreich ring in a week's time, with Patrick Head and Williams chief mechanic Alan Chalice scratching their heads over the wheel nut failure. Quote, we talked the wheel nuts up properly on the grid, there was no tyre stop, it shouldn't have happened. Unquote. While Lotus boss Peter Wall looked fairly chipper afterwards, oh, I think both of our chaps did rather well, don't you? Which would have been news to the unhappy Nakajima. Music 